Hey guys, welcome to our video. We're going to talk about another Fair Debt Collection Practices Act violation. And the one that we'll look at today is when you send a cease and desist letter. And we'll talk about what that means because there's two ways to do it. What happens when you send that, but the debt collector ignores it? So that's what we'll talk about. The part of the law that we're looking at is 1692C and then subpart C. So what I have on the screen here is what you as the consumer do, and on the next screen we'll have what the debt collector is allowed to do even after getting a cease and desist letter. So if a consumer notifies a debt collector in writing, I want to stop right there, it has to be in writing. There are times when consumers believe it does not have to be in writing, when lawyers believe it does not have to be in writing. And there are a lot of things you can do verbally. Uh, you may be getting blown up with a robo-dialer to your cell phone. Well, a lot of times you can revoke consent verbally. And you can tell a, a debt collector that you dispute the debt verbally, and that triggers obligations for the debt collector. But if you want the protection of this section, it has to be in writing. So what do we say in that? Well, there's two things we can say. And you'll notice in here, there's no magic language. You don't have to use some formulaic recitation of words. You just have to tell the debt collector that you refuse to pay the debt. If you do that, that is a cease communication letter. Or you can say the consumer wishes the debt collector to cease further communication with the consumer. So let's go through some examples. If you just say, I refuse to pay this debt, that qualifies. If you say, I'll never pay this debt to you, that would qualify. If you say, cease and desist communication, that would qualify. If you say, I don't ever want to hear from you again, that would qualify. Never contact me again, that would qualify. So you don't have to use some magic language like cease and desist. You just let the debt collector know either I'm never going to pay this debt, so there's no point in you contacting me, or whether I'm going to pay it or not, I don't ever want you to contact me again. If you do one of those, then that tells the debt collector that you have demanded that they cease communication. And then notice what's in green, the word shall. This is not a suggestion. It's not, hey, debt collectors, we would really like you to do this. You know, this is a guideline. This is a best practice. No, this is absolute, 100%. Debt collectors shall not communicate further with the consumer with respect to such debt, except, on the next screen, we'll look at the three exceptions. Now, what I have in the brackets down here at the bottom is actually beneath the exceptions, if you read the statute. It makes more sense here. It's just saying, look, if you mail this to the debt collector, it's only effective or, quote, complete upon receipt. So, well, how else would I get it to them? Well, you, you know, if it was a local debt collector, you could drop it by, you know, hand delivery to them. But the point is, however you get it to them, they must receive it for it to be effective. If they do not receive it, it's no good. So there are some things in the law, like take, for example, Section 1692G, which is what's called the validation notice. That's the one that says you have 30 days to dispute. If you dispute in writing... We'll verify the debt. We'll get you the name of the creditor, that sort of stuff. That is an obligation the debt collector has to send you. That's the key. To send you. They must mail it to you. It does not have to get to you. They just have to mail it. Here, if you want them to cease communication, they have to actually know that that's what you mean. So it makes sense. They have to receive it. So send it certified. Send it overnight. Don't just put a stamp on it and mail it, because if you're dealing with a debt collector who will break the law, well, they'll just lie and say they never got it. So we'll talk about this a little bit more in the conclusions, but the point is you send it in writing, they get it, you say, I'm not going to pay this debt, or you say, cease communication, stop calling me, don't ever contact me again, then they cannot communicate with you, except, here are the three exceptions. Now, as you look at this, I've highlighted in yellow, the, the thread through these three things is to advise you, it's to notify you. So look at number one, advise the consumer debt collector's further efforts are being terminated. 
That's kind of interesting. You say, don't ever contact me again. So they write to you and say, we're not going to contact you again. Okay. Now we might go, well, that's kind of silly. But hey, at least you know your letter worked. They're not going to contact you again. Or number two, to notify the consumer that the debt collector or creditor may invoke specified remedies. So they would explain what those are, lawsuit, put a lien on your property, whatever it might be, which are ordinarily invoked by such debt collector or creditor. So here's the way I look at that. If you've got a debt collector and they say, all right, we got your cease and desist letter, uh, but be advised that we may sue you. And they have never filed a lawsuit in the entire 100-year existence of their company. Then I think they violated this law because it's things that they ordinarily invoke. Now, number two, this second exception is not saying we are going to do all these things. It says we may do these things. Now, number three, slightly different. We're applicable to notify the consumer that the debt collector or creditor intends to invoke a specified remedy. So that subpart two might be, hey, we may sue you. We may put a lien on your property. We may do this. We may do that. But number three is to say, oh yeah, we are going to sue you. Okay. So again, it have to be something that they have the legal right to do or else it would violate section E and some other sections or that they uh, intend to do. So they have to have the legal right, whatever they're threatening you with, and they have to have the intention to actually do it if under subsection 3 they're saying, hey, we intend to do this. So take a step back. You send them in writing, I refuse to pay the debt, stop communicating with me. They cannot communicate with you except to tell you we're not going to bother you anymore. Or number two, we may use these following remedies that we have, that we ordinarily use. And then number three, they can say, we are going to do this, maybe file a lawsuit. So what are some conclusions? You got to send the cease and desist or refusal to pay in writing. So it, it has to be in writing. And somebody says, well, what if I tell them and it's being recorded? Isn't that good enough? That's not in writing. It has to be in writing. Number two, you have to be able to prove that they got the letter. So send it certified mail. If this is important enough to do, it's worth spending seven or eight bucks on certified mail. And certified mail is where they sign the green card, you get the green card back. That's your proof that they received it. It's so vital to have that. Now you could do FedEx or UPS. And so when I say certified mail, I really mean anything where you can prove that they actually received it. Somebody say, what about a fax? What if I get the fax confirmation? Well, m maybe that's good enough. But, you know, your fax machine says it was delivered or e-fax says it was delivered and they say we never got it. Well, now you're, you're fighting over this. Just send it in writing, a hard copy, certified FedEx UPS. Then number three, if the debt collector communicates with you other than those exceptions, then I would look to sue them. So this will be a review if you've seen our other videos, but just real quick because I have consumers come to me, I have lawyers come to me and say, John, I got this great case I want to send you. It's a fantastic case and they're telling me about it. And then we realize this is not consumer debt or we're not dealing with the debt collector. The FDCPA doesn't apply. So for the FDCPA to apply, you have to be a consumer, has to be consumer debt. We're not talking about business debt. We have to be dealing with a debt collector, so not Capital One, their original creditor. Okay, We're talking about a debt collector here that meets the definition of a debt collector. And then we have to have a violation of the FDCPA, so it has to be something harassing or they lied to you or they're being unfair to you. And then if you do sue, remember you can get actual or compensatory damages. Those are to compensate you, to bring you back to where you were right before this debt collector injured you or damaged you then you get statutory damage even if you have no actual damage even if it didn't bother you in the least you can still get a thousand dollars up to a thousand dollars for them violating the law and that's to encourage you to bring suit because the federal government does not have the time or the resources to go after all the abusive debt collectors so what they do is they say all right consumers 
if a debt collector violates the law against you, even if it didn't hurt you, we want you to sue them. And we'll pay you up to $1,000. And we'll pay your lawyers. And we'll cover your costs of litigation. We'll make the, the debt collector that abused you, we'll make them pay for all that because that will police the bad, abusive, dishonorable, law-breaking debt collectors. And it'll make the whole industry better. So the government wants you to bring these lawsuits. And then if you have a state law, for example, invasion of privacy is one we almost always use when we're suing under the FDCPA. That may allow you to get punitive damages. You may have a state version of the FDCPA that may or may not allow punitive damages, but If it allows punitive damages, definitely take advantage of that. Punitive damages are to punish the debt collector for doing something recklessly or intentionally. And it's to deter that debt collector and all other debt collectors from ever doing that again. You want to make it so painful that they say, we'll never make that choice again by breaking the law. So appreciate you watching this video. If you have comments, feel free to put those below. If you have something specific you want to ask about a particular debt collector or maybe a possible case you have, then I'd suggest you know get with us sort of privately on that. You can call us or fill out a contact form on alabamaconsumer.com and I'll get right back with you. And if you have any suggestions for other violations that you would like me to cover, in this sort of style where instead of just telling you what it is or instead of looking at a case, which we'll do all of those, but this one I wanted to be able to say, here's the violation, here's the specific section, or as in the last video, you know, we had to sort of bounce back and forth between a number of sections to sort of get the whole picture. So if, if you like this, uh, definitely let me know what other ones you want me to cover and subscribe to our channel. That way you'll be notified when we release them. So thanks a lot, guys, and you have a great day. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.